be back. Uh, you know, there is there is something about you know spending the time and having the time to rest and to uh, to go and visit other churches. I saw so many of the churches, um, but it is so good to be home. Um, it is good to be with this family and to worship God with this body of believers. This, you are my brothers and you are my sisters, and I have missed you. Uh, I missed the, the time that we've had to, to grow together and uh, and to just spend the time together, ups and the downs, you know, that's the way life goes, and, and I'm so glad to be, be back, and and I'm really thrilled, we got some great, a, a great passage of scripture uh, to spend some time with today, too, and so uh, would you pray with me before we, we dive into that? Uh, Lord God Almighty, you are just so awesome that you're... Your salvation is worth us, uh, it's worth us dancing day and night because of what you've done for us. Um, and Lord, now we're going we're to slow it down a little bit. We're going to spend some time looking in, into what you have done and how you've done it and what our response is to that. And so Lord, we pray that, that, that you will just make this clear to us, give me the right words to say, and give, me a, give me a pure heart to say it. And, uh, and Lord, we pray that we might be able to take these things that you're teaching us uh, out into the world around us in Jesus' name. Um, all right, I'm going to ask you to, to pull out your Bible, however you get it. We've got a few Bibles there uh, in the pews ahead of you. Um, if you have a, a tablet or phone or something, you can pull that out. Uh, to John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, this is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We're going to spend some time with this passage today. Um, and I'm just going to read our way through it, and we're going to, I'm going to comment on a few things that are really important for us. Uh, beginning in verse 12, the next day the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and uh, went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. And as Jordan said, that means, that means save, or oh save us. That's their cry for, for Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. This is an important thing. They want to make Jesus king. And that goes along with the Hosanna, right? Save us because we want you to be king because there are other people who are in charge over us. We don't like them. We want you to come and take their place. And so it's, it's almost, I mean, we don't do elections this way, but this is kind of like them casting their vote. I vote for Jesus for king, right? I want, I want you to be king. You, want, you are our king. We're laying this at your feet, Jesus. As you're coming in humbly on a donkey, you've shown us that you're pretty awesome. You can do miracles. We think you're the Messiah. You can do this. All right. Um, very important to, to see as we go on. Uh, picking it up then in verse 14. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Uh, at first, the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. All right, verse 17. Now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the phrase I want to pick up on here. Look at how the whole world has gone after him. Might not seem like much of a phrase at first, but there's something that John does in his gospel. I just love it. He has these places where he has these dual meanings. Where there's sort of an initial meaning that you pick up right away. Like, yes, of course, it seems like the whole world's going after Jesus. But there's another meaning above it that kind of captures a lot of the essence, the theology even, of what's going on. And this is one of those places. You can see that in the word world, or in the Greek it's cosmos. Right, the whole cosmos, the whole world is going after Jesus. Obviously, they're all waving their palm branches. People are coming to see him. It seems like the tide has turned toward Jesus. So you can see, first you say, we were trying to make this guy lower. It looks like he's getting higher. Okay? Plain and simple. But the, the, there's another meaning to that. When you grab the word world and you look at it in the context of the entire gospel. So all the way through God, John's Gospel, the word cosmos, or world, is kind of a negative thing. The world is living in darkness. The world has been deceived. The world is filled with every kind of temptation. The world rejects the light. The world embraces 
those, uh, those things of the things that are that are not good for us. And so when we when we see the world in the Gospel of John, it's kind of it, there's this sort of darkness to it. E even a few verses, we're not going to get there today, but a, a few verses after what we're talking about, Jesus even says that the time has come for the prince of this world to be cast out. Hmm. So what does it mean then if the, the double meaning, what would it mean then if the world in its darkness is coming after Jesus? Well, we have to take this now back to the triumphal entry. What did they want Jesus to be? They wanted him to be king. Okay. What goes along with being a king? Power? You betcha. Influence? Status? Riches? So that pretty much summarizes every kind of temptation that we face. And all of them placed at Jesus' feet. Everybody in their election said, Jesus, have this. Have the power. Have the riches. Have the status. Everything. We trust you with it. You can have it. Now, we know people in our world who have all of those things. And we also know that there are huge temptations that go along with it. It's like, it's like you're playing with fire. And we all know about things like this, right? You all have things. We all have things. I have things that I know that I kind of want, but I know aren't good for me. I would like to have this thing, whatever it might be, but if I get it, it's not going to go well in the end. It might be fun or nice and good for a little time, but in the long run, this is not good for me. This is not the right thing. And, and the, the analogy I, I think of is anybody who struggles with, with addictions, you know, especially those Especially those who have been have been sober, you may be alcoholics, and some of you may struggle with alcoholism. I mean, that's and that's that's a very real thing, you know. But you know, let's just say let's just say you know you're you're struggling with alcoholism or or now you're you recovered and you're and you're and you're 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 years sober and you're at a party somewhere and nobody knows there that you're you're a recovering alcoholic, but then suddenly the, the host comes and hands you that drink and there it is in your hand. And, and things churn on the inside. Because there's, there is still a part, right, that says, boy, that'd be nice. There's the other part that says, this sends me down a very, very terrible road. And there's that tension, that struggle, right, between those two things. Sort of the immediate gratification versus the long-term detriment of having that thing. And so, and so for, you know, for someone who struggles in this way, you, you essentially have to die to that desire. You have to die to that thing inside of you that says this might be a good thing. It just has to go under the ground and buried there because, because otherwise you might go and do things that you regret doing. So you just die to that. Die to that desire. Die to that way of thinking. Die to that thing inside of you that's saying, do it. And I think that's also what Jesus is showing us. Here he is, he's, he's going into Jerusalem, and they're offering the world to him. And he needs to be the one to say, no. That's not what my kingdom is about. My kingdom isn't like your kingdoms. My kingdom is one where people sacrifice for the sake of one another and lift everybody up. All right, so we're going we're gonna to move on um, with, uh, with our passage. Okay, so we are picking it up. Uh, where were we? Um, okay, verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, and Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And so, and so this is all about Jesus finally having the world come to him. This is in like the first sense, right? There are Greeks. These are people from, they are Gentiles. Jesus has said from the very beginning that his, that his gospel would be spread through the people outside of the Jews. And now they have come to him. He is staring in the face the future of his church. And he says, now... The hour has come. All right? This is where you pick up at 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now listen to what he says. 
I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Okay, we'll just kind of leave it at that. Uh, what is the message he's sending to these Greeks? He's saying, I'm going to reject this offer of the world to be a king the way the world wants me to be. And instead, I'm going to die. Now let's work on that analogy for a little bit. Think of yourself as a kernel of wheat. Just do it. Try. Okay? A kernel of wheat, you can do this. A kernel of wheat, you are a kernel of wheat, you've been able to grow, you've been able to mature, you're good for lots of things. But in order for you to produce more kernels of wheat, you have to go under the ground. And if you go under the ground, you are no longer a kernel of wheat. But there's also no guarantee that you'll come back up either. Right? I mean, any gardeners around here? Have you ever planted a seed that didn't grow? Right? It happens. So is there some fear there? You're a kernel of wheat. You get to be all these wonderful things as a kernel of wheat. But you are only a kernel of wheat and forever will be a kernel of wheat. Unless you take that plunge. And you go under the ground. And you deny all of those things that you could have been. So that there might be more. That's what Jesus is talking about. And, and for us, we have this focus on, oh no, I have to sacrifice and, and that's a human nature thing. Jesus doesn't have that in mind. He has in his sight the seeds that are going to be. He has in mind, he's looking in the faces of the seeds that will be because of his death and resurrection. He's looking at the future kernels, the future church that would then die and bring about more and more and more. And so when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, yes, he has come to die, but usually we think of him on a cross first. But first, before he can die on a cross, he has to die to the world. He has to die to the desires of the world. Because they were laid right before him. Come to our king. Jesus says here that, that, we, that we are to hate our lives in this world. And I, I, mean, I don't like the word hate, okay? Hate is a really bad word in our world today, but I can't like worm my way out of it with the Greek either. It actually says hate. Um, we're to hate our lives in this world, and I think we need to see it properly. When Jesus looks at what was offered to him, Okay, you're offered riches. People with riches, I hate to say it, but when people with riches have a tendency to hoard them and keep other people poor. Okay, this is the way it works. People with power, all right? Same kind of thing. People with power have a tendency to like to keep their power and lord it over others. Status, okay. People with status have a tendency to have had to step on people to gain it. These are all sorts of the things in this world that are darkness, that are, that are not good for us. Jesus said, no, I hate those things. I would rather humble myself to lift everyone up than ascend to some sort of status where I put people down. So he says, no, I'm going to die to them. I'm going to die to that kind of life. I don't want that kind of life. I would rather serve. I would rather be on the bottom than be on the top. And so that's, that's what Jesus does. I think that's, that's the call for us in our lives. Now, every one of us, we, we all do this in different ways. I mean, there are different temptations. The, the world presents itself to us in all sorts of different ways. So there is no kind of one-size-fits-all. Like, I can go and say, well, everybody, this is the exact way you go and die to the things of this world. Because, you know, every one of us have different temptations, right? But I can't help but to see a, a beautiful example of that sitting right over here. And, and I just I just want to speak to them a little bit, uh, Ron and, and Matt, Ashley, Gracie. I, I I just want to thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, America offers you comfort, and and America offers you convenience, and America offers you this sense of control over your life. And and I know you are consciously saying no to that. Um, 
And, and we could, for a moment, kind of feel sorry for you, but I don't want us to do that. Because it's not about what you lose, it's about what can be gained, right? It's about the seeds. And, and some of us have been there, some of us know the faces and the, and the names and the people and the children. We see the seeds. We see them, we know them, they're on our hearts and we pray for them. And we're so thankful that you are willing to die to the, the conveniences of America. To, to make a commitment to them so that they can sprout and grow. And we just want to bless you in that and, and just encourage you in that so that you know it is worth it. It is worth every sacrifice you make along the way. And I, I just bet, I just bet you're going to get there and you're going to start loving on these people and you're not going to think of it for a moment like a sacrifice. Because you'll see God sprouting and growing on these people. And that is such our heart too. We want to bless you in that. All right. So thank you. Thank you for that. And this is, and this is one example. And of course, it's, it's you know, we're going to lift them up. And I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on a pedestal or anything like that. Um, but instead, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing this. And we all have a role to play in this too, in our own lives and in our own spheres, wherever it is, dying to the world so that others can be lifted up, so they can know Jesus and his love, forgiveness, and a life that goes on forever. We're all in this together. So let's pray. Uh, Lord God Almighty, uh, it, is, it is only by your grace that we are saved. Um, no sacrifice of our own can do it. But rather we look to your sacrifice, the sacrifice for sin, the sacrifice that cleanses our hearts and gives us forgiveness. But it's also a sacrifice, Lord, that we mimic in our lives, something that we live also as we also reject the things that you rejected and embrace the things that you embraced by loving other people and lifting them up by giving them the truth about the forgiveness of sins through Jesus alone, and by multiplying ourselves into others who can then multiply even yet. Lord, we're not going to pretend like it's easy to make these sacrifices. It wasn't for you. Um, but we, we are praying for strength and courage and unity as we do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.